morning. Welcome to the Public Safety Committee meeting. I'm Mitchell Englander. I'm joined by Council Members Mike Bond and Mitchell Farrell. We have a quorum, so we're going to go ahead and run through what I hope to be first the consent uh, calendar. And um, with that, colleagues, what I'd like to move is items 1, 2, and 5, 9 and 10, 11 and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 on consent. And uh, do any of those have reports that need approvals as well? No, Mr. Chair. <coughs> All right, so without objection, that'll be the order. Those items are approved. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump into item 8 first, and that is the ordinance with one day or short term permit for parking operators. Good morning, Council Members. Richard T. Fank, Executive Director of the Board of Police Commissioners. Uh, this ordinance was um, introduced to alleviate a problem that is occurring in the Homely Hills area related to uh, large uh, private parties where valet service is utilized and the vehicles are being parked south of Sunset, which is impacting neighborhoods that are not having the parties. We attempted earlier to try and craft a, uh, an amendment to our current valet ordinance as relates to the exception to a, a requirement for a valet uh, permit for a one-day event that is non-recurring at a residential property. In meeting with the city attorney and discussing that further, uh, that will not work. So this motion is intended to create a process where a one-day valet permit would be, be required by the valet com uh, company. Right for the operation of valet services at a residence. Currently, all valet operators in the city of Los Angeles are required to have a business permit through the Board of Police Commissioners, which the vast majority of them do. We find those occasionally, and as we do, we get them into compliance. Sure. This process, the way we see this working as the development of the ordinance would be that I am a, I'm a private uh, residence owner and I want to utilize the services of a valet company. I would have to contact a valet company. All permitted valet companies will know that they are required to get a one-day permit for that particular entity to have the use of their valet services. They would get the contract with that individual property owner that wants to have the services. They would then come to the police commission, apply for a one-day permit. Mm -hmm. If it is a very simple one-day permit, we have not had negative impacts in the neighborhood in the past. That process we see is very simple, a very nominal fee to issue the permit to the valet operator. How much is that? Pardon me, sir? How much is that fee? Seventy-five? We would see it probably not even $75 for that because the company already has a master valet permit. The company already has its permit. When you, so what, what, what I'm most concerned with is this is where I'm at with it. Um, solving a very specific, isolated, geographically um, troubled problem that's not a citywide issue, and now passing on another cost to homeowners for trying to do the right thing and hire a permitted company, um, and that because the company's not going to absorb that cost, they're going to pass it right on to the customer. Yes, sir. So, do we have any idea of what that cost would? Well, be? I, I can tell you, I would guess. If it's a very simple process, if they turn it in, it's reviewed. Number one, does the company have a permit? That's very quick for us to determine. Right. And then the issuance of the permit, minimal cost, you know, 10 to 20 bucks is what I'm just estimating off the top, top of my head. Because when would that fee schedule come back to us? That would come back as part of the ordinance because I, I don't know yet what the ordinance is going to say and the, how the operational steps of that would be that we would have to take. Okay. So you have one permit fee, very minimal, nominal fee to issue that permit for so, that type of So event. then if it comes back, it's ping that that's a problem location, then they would have to file another fee for a review of parking, et cetera. Exactly right. That, that, that's that, what would escalate the exactly higher cost of correct. those because chronic every, problem areas. You require a parking plan review, require an on-site visit by, by our investigators, and that would have its 
a fee, okay. which would be a higher assessed fee. Okay, so what's before us then is simply to ask for the amendments from the city attorney on the ordinance, and then that will come back to committee with the fee schedule. It'll come back with our operational implementation plan and with the, the two fee schedules. Okay. Um, colleagues, are you okay with that? Any questions? Okay, we'll go ahead and move that Thank and, you, uh, and ask that that will go to council, but then that both of those, the operational fee schedule and new draft ordinance will come back to committee. Will be the instruction. Very good, sir. Thank okay. you very much. Thank Have you. a good day. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. Let's go ahead and take item four, if we could. Item number four is the Board of Police Commissioners report relative to requesting the city attorney to modify Los Angeles Municipal Code section 103.205 um, to accommodate current business practices. Good morning, uh, Richard T. Fank, again, Executive Director of the Board of Police Commissioners. As you know, the Board of Police Commissioners through Commission Investigation Division administers the uh, program for permitting of massage parlor establishments in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, several months back, the, commi the uh, commission brought forward to council, which was adopted, a new ordinance to comport with new state law that was effective January 1 of 2015. As a result of that, uh, it was discovered after implementation that some of the requirements of that uh, new ordinance impacted businesses that had been operating without law enforcement issues. And one of the, the issues that I'll just highlight would be that the requirement in the new ordinance that they have shower or bath facilities. They could have been a long-standing operation, very legitimate business operation, and did not have that. Um, that was an error on our part in working with the city attorney, so that would be one of those things that we would want to see fixed. The rest of them are enumerated here, so we would just request the direction to the city attorney to prepare uh, the ordinance, bring the ordinance back uh, to committee, and uh, clean up the, the ordinance to comport with the state law and also be more business friendly to those businesses that are operating within the law and not a law enforcement problem. Be happy to answer any questions. I'm going to turn it over uh, first to my colleague, Mitchell Farrell. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. T. Fink. Yeah, you know, um, massage has gone mainstream and you have uh, massage franchises and operators who are small business operators. There's a demand for it and um, we want to make sure that when we regulate the industry, we don't do so at the expense of entrepreneurs who, you know, companies like Massage Envy, Brooke Williams, who may not always be able to build a shower, um, but operate perfectly legitimate, uh, you know, massage therapy uh, and massage services, even at our malls. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I mentioned, it's gone mainstream and it's more affordable. And um, I think this is a sensible um, fix to the original ordinance. Uh, and I think that it doesn't make it any more difficult to enforce. No. In fact, it might actually make it a little uh, easier to, uh, without the requirement of providing showers and, and, and all that. So my staff has worked very, very closely with city attorney's office, your office, um, on, on seeing this forward. And so I, I'm very pleased with um, uh, what we have before us. And I think it's very sensible, very fair, uh, and reasonable. Thank you, sir. Thank you. One, one question I yes, have sir. on it, though, was the elimination. It was under bullet number three, which was the requirement for the establishment to submit copies of each California Massage Therapist Council certificate um, be eliminated because the information is online. Um, I'm more comfortable with us than having them submit it um, and us also having a copy of it while that might be redundant. I don't, I'm not comfortable knowing that um, while it's online, oftentimes then it won't even be checked, um, perhaps. And I'm not, I'd like to keep that in if possible, unless it is impossible. It's not impossible, sir. It just, uh, uh, the, when the company applies for the permit, one of the requirements is that they would provide us a list of who their employees right. are who are, are certified therapists. We have the ability to access that information online. If you'd like to have them still submit that to us on a 30-day basis as there would be turnover, that's fine. That's not, I not onerous. And, and I think then us having it in the files um, rather than having one of our own staff be responsible for having to go check and see if it's online and that falling through the cracks, if you will, and um, 
I'd rather put the onus on them since for the very reasons we're trying to crack down on these okay. kinds of establishments without opening up that entire conversation. I think we all know what that is. Um, so, colleagues, if you could, I'd like to um, remove that item and keep continue that requirement. Okay. Anything else on this one? No. Nope. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Before thank you. we vote on these, actually, I do have, Wayne, you filled out a number of cards. Why don't you come on up and spend your five minutes wasting our time on 427... Eight and seventeen. Stay on subject, or you'll be removed. Thank you. And will that be a combined five minutes? Um, yeah, we're so we're going to recall the consent items as well. So okay. we're going to go ahead and recall those consent items. He actually had, I'm sorry, only items two and seventeen. So we'll re bring those back two and seventeen to combined five, five items. That'll that's his required by law allowance under um, our charter. So he'll have items four, two, seven, eight. And 17. And prior to that, um, Mr. Chair, would you like to reconsider the items um, yes. now that we have another yes. council? So we'll go ahead and reconsider those items. So without objection, okay, those items are all before us. Okay. Floor is yours. All right. Item seven is a very interesting item. Uh, you want to give John letters to the registered owners of vehicles that are seen driving around and high prostitution areas of the city. Yeah, that's a good idea. We should definitely start having a policy of recording the driver's licenses and the, the license plates of all cars in the city. So when they're driving in certain areas, the registered owners receive a letter from the city that the car was seen in this given area of potential problems to the registered owner to let them know that their car was seen in certain areas of the city of Los Angeles that may be high risk. <laughs> but I think we should extend this pro process on item seven, not just to high prostitution areas, but for example, in a place where there's a high density black population and somebody's car is seen with a white driver, that also that owner should receive a registered letter to indicate that that car registered to a white area was seen in a black area so that the registered owner knows that their son or daughter or their significant other is going into an area likely buying drugs. And I think that this pro policy is good. We should have it for other areas, such as adjacent cities where gambling takes place. For example, in Commerce, off the 5 Freeway, where the city borders the casino areas, again, once the car crosses a city border into that gambling area, the registered owner should receive a gambling letter so that, again, the city knows that to the owner that the city is making sure that they're watching your every move and notifying you of it. What a great city. Such a good idea. If Hitler were here, he would applaud you today. Because that's what item seven is. Item seven is fucking fascism on, on steroids. How the hell can you take the fact that a license plate on a car is in a particular area, that the government has a responsibility to send a letter accusing somebody of being a John in an area of high prostitution. What a, what a disgusting notion. What a violation of the First Amendment. This has got ACLU injunction and class action written all over it because you are presumpting criminal activity merely by time, place, and manner of a vehicle in a given area. All you have to do is have one incidence, if this passes, of a person whose car had a flat tire, and they get a, John, a Dear John letter, and they can prove that they've never so much as been in the area before, your asses are going to get slapped with a lawsuit, and it should. This is another example of a city out of control, a government out of control that thinks that they have to monitor and be a nanny state on a micromanaged level of people. Your job is to, is to plant trees, to cut them and maintain them, to maintain sidewalks and sewers, and you do a goddamn bad job of it too. 
So why don't you stick to those issues and actually try to fix our sewers, the $4.4 billion of, of waste at the DWP before you worry about if somebody's car was seen in a high prostitution area of the city. Also, the property owners in that area would also have a lawsuit for inverse condemnation for the decline in value of their properties. These properties will be in a zone labeled as high prostitution, labeled as presumptive harassment against anybody in the community. So these people would be able to sue for the diminution of value of their real estate because you have presumptively criminalized anybody's car that was found in the area. You're so fucking stupid, you can't even see that. Because you're so drunk with power. You're so drunk with power, you don't see what you're doing before you do it. And finally, when it gets done, and the city gets hit with lawsuits and outside attorney's fees and the millions of dollars, which Paul Krikorian in this room gives out $94 million already this year, that shows you you don't know what's going on. And finally, the chairman of this committee... You won't will, address any one of Will you take show take up to your right, meetings, so, sir? Thank you very much. Show up Time here. Time is done. Thank you. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the First Amendment. And... Uh, those are your rights. Goodbye. All right. I know it's the first amendment. See you later. Now you're disrupting the meeting, so you can leave. Thank you. If you're going to disrupt the meeting, you'll be asked to leave. And we'll see you at all the other committee meetings, I'm sure. Okay. Um, with that, we'll actually try to get back to business. Um, and so we'll go back and approve, reapprove uh, items on consent. We're 2 and 17. And then we took item 4 and item 8, so those items, uh, 8 was, um, I'm sorry, 4 was amended to include the third bullet point uh, in the report rather than exclude for the permits to, uh, for the certificates to be filed. And so uh, those would be before us without objection, those are all approved. Okay, thank you very much. So that will now take us to... What was item three? Is that what we needed to hear next? It was item three. And item number three is the um, Chief Administrative Officer report relative to the fourth amendment to a contract with Motorola Solutions um, for the installation of communications and equipment at the Northeast Area Police Station. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you can just state your names for the record and walk us through this. Sure. Maggie Goodrich, Chief Information Officer for the LAPD. Tyler Munhall, CAO. So what you have before you, uh, council members, is an amendment to the Master Services Agreement with Motorola um, to do two things. One is to add funding to fund a, um, some radio equipment that we need to get the new Northeast Police Station up and running. Um, the other is to add contingency funds to the Master Services Agreement. And the idea behind that is that um, once the contingency funds are authorized, we will still do a contract <coughs> amendment each time to expend those funds because we have to identify the funds, identify the project, have it approved by the city attorney, and have it approved as being a part of, um, one, a sole source justification with Motorola. So it would be for things like um, an upgrade to our existing Motorola CAD or an upgrade to our existing Motorola radio, something like that, where a sole source is approved by the city attorney. Uh, but also the fundings will have to be identified and approved as well, and then we'll execute a contract amendment. The hope in identifying the um, or getting approval from city council ahead of time on raising the ceiling of the contract is that though we will go through the contract amendment each time, um, the hope is that by having approval sort of um, in a lump sum ahead of time, it will speed up the process for those contract amendments going forward. Um, as you can see from this one uh, before you today, it went to Board of Police Commissioners in July. It's just coming before you today for approval here in um, second half of November. So the goal is to get an approval up front and then allow us to execute amendments as we identify funding and get approval from the city attorney on different uh, scope of work. Yeah, it's just unusual to take that measure. And um, while I appreciate trying to cut through a lot of the bureaucracy and get things done, particularly when it, we're talking about technology and uh, being the backbone of 
you know, from whether it be communications or a CAD operations, whatever those might be, as I'm a firm believer in all those things. Um, I am concerned that we just have a blanket increase without anything really attached to it and where it came from. So if, if I may give a little background on, on why I'm doing this, while it is unusual for the police department, it is not unusual for other city departments. So for example, all of the um, uh, procurements through GSD that we do are on contracts that have large ceilings on them for bank blanket approvals. Well, those and are they, usually supplies, which is yes, a little different. Yeah, absolutely. Equipment um, that require on, then warranties and maintenance and and the like so it's correct the the um, other department I guess would point to that does this more on the services side would be ITA um, for a lot of their uh, contracts and hiring contract programmers and, and the like um, they do a, a similar process so so strictly from um, colleagues strictly from a public safety perspective and where I sit as chair of the committee uh, I have no problem with what we need to do and understanding full well what it takes to get these things done and the requests and the timeline and um, from a budgetary perspective um, I'm not sure that um, this I won't say it's precedent setting because I'm sure there are places we've done things that are similar um, but while it's not then budgeted uh, is this going to the budget and finance committee I don't know if it was referred to budget and finance committee I don't know if it has been either I, I have a little more comfort with that if you don't mind and duly referring it for that discussion because I don't think that discussion is technically appropriate for this committee um, I think any public safety related questions or concerns which I have none of on this um, should be asked and answered here and but from a budgetary perspective I think it should go to the, the budget and finance committee um, and I'm sure we can help arrange trying to get it scheduled there right away they do meet every week so it won't be held up um, but I would ask that if, if that's okay we go ahead and not have a little more comfort um, going to that one one question is the Northeast division we already had kind of a soft opening of the new station and uh, it should be fully operational within a few months what is the risk to you know we, we do need to get that going um, right away in order to, to meet the opening so let's let's talk about a timeline to move this through then what part of the city is this in what part of the city what community at Northeast is North the Glass Hill Park. Glass Hill Park. Thank you. Park. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'm from the valley. <laughs> where, where I live. <laughs> to me, Northeast, <laughs> Northeast Valley. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a, it's a, an ironic name, but and we yeah. keep going. This this station keeps having. We've had. Uh, well, if you read the reports, and um, there's been a lot of cost overruns and issues, and a lot of problems and lagging to get this thing up and running and and uh, but notwithstanding that I think again from a public safety perspective I don't have a problem with this um, while it's not traditional um, that I'd be more comfortable with going through that in terms of timeline I'd ask that we uh, immediately if we could mr. clerk um, contact the uh, budget and finance committee chair and ask that they get this on the next available agenda which should be next Monday yes yeah, so we will work with your office and the budget and finance committee to make sure that that happens and then um, Pot with a, with you know possibly a placeholder for council as well, so we don't have to work through that. We can get it moving as quickly as possible. That would be appreciated. Thank you. No other questions. Okay, then it'll be approved with uh, going to budget and finance and then council. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for staying around for this as well. All right, uh, next item, please. Um, would you like to hear item number six, mix, Mr. Chair? Um, item six would be great, and. Um, on item six, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to our colleague and the mover of the motion. Thank you very much. And I believe we have the department, both Commander Pitcher and Lieutenant Evans here. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank uh, you and Mr. Kokorian for seconding this motion. For those of you who uh, know a little bit about the things that I care most in my district, one happens to be this human trafficking issue and the two major prostitution tracks in my district, but particularly I want to talk about the motion. Back in April, um, I met with Deputy Chief um, Bob Green, and he has uh, a lot of experience in dealing with, home, um, with human trafficking based on where he was um, uh, stationed before um, in South Bureau, I believe that's where he came from. And so he shared with me uh, a couple of ideas so that we can start um, looking at this uh, issue a little bit differently 
And we've done a good job as a city and, and as a department in terms of how we're viewing these kids that are being trafficked uh, throughout our city. And so we had a, a, a speaker earlier today. What people fail to understand is that the majority of the women the, that we are talking about are children. Uh, we're talking about as young as 13 years old, kids that are basically being dropped um, in my district at all hours of the day and, and being trafficked by pimps, mostly gang members. And so uh, Chief uh, Green and I talked about a human, uh, San Fernando Valley Human Trafficking Task Force to be able to come at this um, issue um, in different ways, not only ensuring that we find, um, that we rescue these kids and view them as victims, but that we also t do our best to work with them and target some of these pimps and arrest them and, and get them off the street. And then also giving us additional tools to go after the Johns that think it's okay to pick up a 13-year-old on Sepulveda and Victory Boulevard. So I'm, I have the department here. Thank you very much um, for being here. If you just share with us um, a little bit about the task force um, and what you, how you, how you see this moving forward. And then if you can also share with us some of the latest statistics in terms of the arrest of Johns and pimps in the San Fernando Valley. Thank you. Okay. Um, the objective of the task force is that we have a, a long time, a long standing prolific problem with uh, prostitution, human trafficking, and the blight that's associated with those um, activities along the Sepulveda Corridor and also off of San Fernando Road and Lancashire Boulevard. So we've, we have plenty of years of history that indicate uh, doing the same approach over and over is, is not really accomplishing what the desired effect might be. So we've established a task force that is designed to reduce the fair and incidence of part one crime, um, which many of these uh, human traffickers, you might refer the, to them as pimps, um, bring with them a rather prolific uh, criminal um, history of violent crime. And so um, we've looked at a three-prong approach on how to uh, address this issue. Uh, those, those tenants are uh, engineering, enforcement, and education. And so we've partnered with Cal State Northridge, a professor named Heinrich Menagians, who is um, a professor regarding urban planning. He's uh, conducting a study where they're mapping the entire area to look at environmental change that can take effect that might help reduce crime, uh, specifically lighting, cleaning up shrubbery, things that can be done by homeowners. Um, and there's, that study's in process right now. Um, and then ultimately we'll work with the community to try to make those changes uh, to help discourage people from visiting the area that would be conducive to crime. Second is the enforcement element. There's a strong emphasis on uh, on going, uh, on taking enforcement measures against Johns. Um, typically, we're going after, historically, I should say, we've been going after the girls who are standing on the street. But to a large extent, those women or children might not be there of their own volition. So we want to look for the people behind the scenes who are, who are bringing the supply side of this uh, dirty business to the streets. Um, so we're, we're doing heavy enforcement. Um, of Johns that are in the area soliciting uh, prostitutes, and we're taking heavy enforcement, uh, traffic enforcement actions against them. Um, to give you an example of what's happened in the first 15 days, so we started this task force um, about a month ago. The first two weeks was involved a lot of training. The second uh, 15 days or so, um, we, we arrested five human traffickers. Uh, we rescued a 16-year-old minor. We have multiple leads of uh, minors who are recruiting other minors to engage in prostitution. We arrested 41 Johns. We cited 155 uh, people who are loitering for prostitution, and we impounded 10 cars. Um, and, and I have statistics from the beginning of the year, too. It's quite a prolific problem. The last component <coughs> is an education, an education piece where we're trying to work with the community to uh, through our slows and also develop stronger partnerships to a large extent the community doesn't feel that they, they have a voice or that they're being heard. So I established an email specific for this problem. It's called 647 Tips. Um, and this allows the community to, to send their concerns. Maybe they're sending photographs, whatever that might be, to us, to the task force. We check it every day. I send officers to their house. They're getting as personalized service as we can possibly provide. 
Um, we talk with them, we get more information, we'll follow up um, on these investigations, and then we will give them a response as regarding the resolution that we um, were able to do. Um, and that's, I don't think I have much more time than that, but that's basically where we're at. That's, that's the goals and objectives that we're using and the direction we're heading at this point. Thank you. The last element uh, is an accountability piece that ultimately is going to look at the functions of what the, all of the entities are that we're bringing aboard. And that'll be uh, department entities, it'll be the senior lead officers, the neighborhood prosecutors, all of the efforts uh, that, that are brought to bear on this problem, we're going to be focusing on the daily, the weekly, and the monthly efforts that they have in order to direct this as strategically as possible to make the inroads into, once again, what Lieutenant Evan said is one of our most prolific problems in terms of human trafficking, to provide not only the enforcement efforts and the community efforts, but to get the individuals wrap around services to ultimately care for these individuals who are the, the focus of this entire effort. Okay. Well, that concludes um, our presentation. <laughs> I say ours because I've been working with these, with these guys for a while. But thank yeah. you very much, uh, Lieutenant and um, Sergeant Evans, for being here this morning. Um, I know it was quite a drive to get here, uh, but I appreciate uh, an hour and a half, sort of, if you're coming from the Valley. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I urge your support to move this forward to City Council and we can get, well, they've already begun the work, um, but we have a yeah. press conference and community meeting on Thursday night, which right. we're going to unroll, you know, we're going to be able to unveil this to the community and have them participate and be active in trying to find solutions to this huge growing problem in the area. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to, uh, first of all, not only commend you all in the department for working on this, but uh, Councilwoman Martinez as well. Here, here's the thing. Um, I was a little disturbed in the presentation, I'll be honest with you. Um, and I hopefully will correct this action for all future reference. There's absolutely no such thing as a child prostitute. A child out on the street, a child being delivered like a pizza is not a prostitute. It's a victim of rape. Um, anybody trying to buy a child um, should not be arrested for prostitution. They should be arrested for child molestation, child rape, lewd and lascivious acts on a child, looking at possible RICO laws, child abuse, human trafficking, um, if not at least conspiracy to commit any and all of the above. They should be publicly shamed, uh, which I absolutely support. Um, and this isn't an issue where it's just on the street. This is a growing issue in every community that people don't even realize because the gangs have figured out that if they can get, and this is, it starts with, you go back to the education piece, bringing in the entertainment business as well. Maybe we can publicly shame some of the music that's out there saying, get yourself a five pack because that means five girls and you make six to $800,000 a year. And they realize, these gangs now realize that instead of selling guns or drugs, because you can only sell those things once, that you can put a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old girl out on the street or online and sell her over and over and over again. It's got to stop. It's, and we have to stop treating the children as criminals. These are victims that have to be treated with serious issues, oftentimes mental health, drug addiction, because these pimps, these gangbangers, these thugs, these cowards that are buying and selling these girls are uh, drugging them often and, um, and putting them out there over and over and over again. So it starts first with the vernacular. We cannot call this prostitution. This is child rape. Uh, and that's first and foremost. And I want to applaud also um, not only what you guys are doing with the task force, and, uh, but also our DA, uh, our city attorney, who are all working together on this as well, Mike Fuhrer and Jackie Lacey, as well as uh, our sheriff, Jim McDonald, who is really taking um, a, a high level um, hands-on approach on this as well uh, and working with our courts to make sure that we do prosecute on a federal level um, and we treat this as it is and call it what it is for once. And so 
um, I'd also like to see an education piece out there publicly where we put up whether they're billboards or ads or we can get some of our media outlets to carry some of the ads putting pictures of girls up there saying not for sale and oh by the way here are the crimes you are going to be charged with if you attempt to, con to and, and have, a, have a role in trying to buy one of these um, victims and so um, thank you for uh, bringing this forward and uh, appreciate all your work Mr. on this. Chair. So with that, um, this, uh, this item is approved and uh, moving Thank you. forward as quickly as possible. Anything to add? No, if we can move on to item seven. Are you guys going to speak on item seven as well? No, we no, have. Uh, okay. well, thank you, Commander. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your support. Morning. Morning. I'm Billy Hayes, Commanding Officer, Robbery Homicide Division. I'm representing uh, Captain Kelly Muldorfer here today from Detective uh, Services Vice Division, uh, Detective Support Vice Division. Uh, Pat Butler, the Lieutenant, is here to discuss the uh, John letter that's with the City Attorney as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, Deputy City Attorney Brian Satelli. Um, speaking as to item number seven, our office has reviewed the proposal. And although there's potential risks, there's always risks, um, our office feels confident and determined that the risks are relatively low. Um, our office will continue to work with LAPD if it determines whether the proposal is a useful tool or a necessary tool to combat prostitution. Um, and we'll also continue to look at how other cities have addressed this issue with similar types of proposals. Right, Mr. Chair, and so the, the reason I, I <clears throat> brought this motion forward, and I want to also thank uh, Mr. Rue for seconding the motion regarding John letters. Again, it's just another tool um, to try to de deter uh, adults from thinking it's okay to go into these types of um, prostitution tracks to pick up uh, or solicit um, prostitution. But I'm also as eager to go back and explore the, um, the impounding of cars again. Um, I know we've been sued in the past, but that's something that I'm also exploring. Again, if we can make it difficult for these folks to, um, to keep coming back and be repeat offenders, it, again, anything we can do to give you additional tools to try to uh, address this issue, whatever helps. Um, I'm not going to stop looking at other ways to uh, deal with this with this growing problem. So whether it comes to letters or publicizing their names in a local newspaper or on the internet and impounding their cars and them having to explain why they came home without a car, uh, that just, I hope, adds to um, the uncomfortable explanation that you're going to have to give your partner or spouse at home as to why there is a letter that now says you're frequencing in a, a place where um, it's known as a prostitution track or you don't have your vehicle or so on, or why your name was publicized in a local newspaper. So again, I'm not going to start stop exploring ways to go after some of these folks. Uh, we just have to be strategic about it and uh, think, think outside of the box. I know communities up in Alameda County um, are exploring these types of um, avenues in terms of these John letters. Uh, we don't have a copy with, I believe I provided you with a copy before the meeting, but um, again, it's just another tool to try to uh, go at this issue any different on on different levels. Let me just get a sense of a couple things. Um, first and foremost, I think what I've said in the last um, on the last item carries completely forward to this one. Uh, we've got to do everything we can, everything that's possible. First and foremost, our primary responsibility, bar none, is to protect children and those most vulnerable in society. Start with that. Um, and this is what this does. A John letter, um, I'm not sure of what this process would do. Would you, you, do you need our, our approval to institute or implement any kind of program like this? Or is this something that just LAPD could or would or should 
um, or may do under certain circumstances on their own unilaterally? Right. Let me just. Do you want to answer? Councilmember, I believe it would be a department issue and they okay. have a policy of So this is more discussion right. of looking at tactics and um, tools that the department may utilize, not necessarily looking for our approval. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, just so I understand where we're at in the conversation on this. The process was, is from my understanding, was to discuss it with the city attorney to look at liability issues to the department and to implement something like this. This has been looked at for a period of years um, and gone through a pro approval processes to get the letter that you see before you for verbiage type of thing. And then in discussion, discussing it with Lieutenant Butler, the concept would be a identifying individuals that are in the area sure. uh, um, either through traffic stops uh, you know discussing it with them identifying the individual or if the area if they're running a task force right. and a vehicles frequenting the area on a number of times making the circuit but there's not a violation that they could address taking that registration and sending the letter to the individual uh, registered owner that right. that vehicle was in the area uh, on a frequent basis as where prostitution activity. And so that's where I would have some very troubling concern over depending on how often or what would trigger the letter. First of all, we've got to do everything we possibly can. And I can't emphasize that enough Agreed. without crossing a line of protecting those also who are, you know, um, we get a pizza delivery guy who's up and down the same street all the time because, oh, yeah, he's del actually delivering real pizza. Um, and a Domino's or whoever driver that all of a sudden his wife gets a letter that says you've been in the area frequently, you know, at odd hours or whatever that might be. Um, so yeah, who would have to It's not the pizza guy. I, I, I get, I get uh, that. I'm not arguing, I, I'm not arguing from out, that perspective. I've been out on these I, I get task force with, with our law yes. enforcement officers to almost four in the morning, and yeah. it's not the pizza guy that's right. frequenting that area. I'm saying what would trigger the letter. I, I well, get, the, uh, well, the I letter, get. the letter basically is a tool yeah. that right. w that the department would utilize as they see necessary. Correct. Correct. Uh, we would use a probable cause standard for loitering for the purposes of prostitution, something we could stop them for anyway. Okay, so yeah. the letter would actually be triggered off p off probable cause. Yeah, officers, Absolutely. not reasonable Ob suspicion. Right. Officers' observations, they meet the, okay. uh, the standard of loitering for the purposes of prostitution. Right. Uh, and then we would write... They'd have to write a report of before issuing, sort of triggering that letter well, of documenting... That, that would be in the works, uh, how we document it, but it would certainly have to have documentation and, and be filed. Okay. You know, so we could pull it up at a later date. I mean, I want to move forward on this. I just want to make sure that there are... Per it, our liability and exposure was brought up and gone over sort of quickly of, and, and uh, over to make sure that, you know, all of a sudden we don't have some hundred million dollar exposure as well to the taxpayer. So I'm trying to balance that, right? And trying to figure out, okay, there's a lot of things we can be doing and we have to go after them hard um, uh, and with, with everything possible. And the task force uh, is great and working with um, the feds and trying to get more money in, which we also done in this uh, committee to, uh, to Im in improve and increase those task forces. Uh, in terms of the letter, I want to make sure that that liability, but you don't need our approval anyway. So I think we're good. We're good there. That's what I needed to know the process of. Um, having said that, um, what's the next step in working with the city attorney for on the language? And will the, the letter be made public? We don't have to approve any language. We, there's nothing before us to approve. So it, we're not approving any process or language to any letter. That would be strictly be done with the city attorney's office? That's correct. Okay. Yes. We'll continue work with the department, uh, council member, on, on crafting the letter and looking at what other cities have done as well. There's other cities that have done this approach. Um, okay. So. so without a written report or anything for us to approve anyway, this was just an update for us to find out what tools and tactics you can That's and you may be yeah. implementing working with the city attorney's office. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. It is more of an informative type of thing based on Councilman Martinez's uh, request. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the task force is having a press conference. Um, I would ask all the media to show up to um, a councilwoman and LAPD's press conference to get as much possible coverage on this as possible. I mean, everybody needs to, to this should be the, the, the front page of every single major newspaper on every single radio station. Um, informing the public on what to look for uh, in their communities and, um, and the signs as well, perhaps even in their own home. Um, and so can you share us a w again 
the information on when the press conference is going to be on Thursday night and where? City Hall on Thursday at 6 p.m. Right. So anybody listening, I'd ask them to please participate in that as well. Thank you. Great. No, thank you very much. Anything else, colleagues? All right. Thank you. Okay. I think it's uh, since it's not there's not it's not an actionable item. It's a uh, uh, receive and file, but send it to council for input as well. Okay. I don't want to hold it here in committee. There's no reason to do that. Yes. So. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Next item. And the last item is item number 18, which is the Chief Legislative Analyst and City Administrative Officer report relative to the Los Angeles Regional Operational Communication Systems, known as LA RICS. Okay. And, and before we dive into that, I know I have a number of cards, but um, everybody has filled out general public comment is what they wrote on their cards. Was there anybody here actually specifically on 18 that meant to write 18 instead of general public comment? One person? Because I don't have any cards on 18 specifically. No? Maybe not. Okay. So nobody's on 18 for general public comment. Okay. Then we'll just come on up and go right into 18. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, we're ready. Yes. All right, good morning, uh, council members. Matias Farfan, Assistant Chief Legislative Analyst. I'm Patty Huber, Assistant CAO. Yes. And, and the item before you today is a report on the Los Angeles Regional Interoperable Communication <laughs> System, which is LA RICS for short. Um, the city has consistently supported interoperability, interoperable communications between public safety agencies in the Los Angeles region. Uh, towards this end, we have been a member of the Alley Ricks uh, Joint Powers Authority since its uh, inception in 2008. Uh, the Alley Ricks Authority is, is tasked with establishing a region-wide uh, system for interoperable communication between public agencies. It's currently implementing two independent communication systems, one for voice communications, which is referred to as LMR for land mobile radio. The second system is for the broadcast of uh, broadband data communications, uh, which is referred to long-term evolution or LTE. Uh, to this intent, uh, the intent of both of these systems is for, for JPA members to share these two common systems and also share in the cost of maintaining these two systems. Uh, the funding sources that would go towards uh, funding the systems are the Urban Area Security Initiative grants uh, for the LMR system and broad, Broadband Technology Opportunity Program grant funds, which are referred to as BTOP grants for the data communication system. Uh, the remaining non-grant funded portion of both systems would be shared by members uh, through the use of a funding plan that was approved by the JPA. Uh, a description of the funding plan is included in the report as attachment four. Um, and the, the, the actual JPA also provides an opt-out process for members to opt out of the JPA. That is also provided in the report as part of atta its attachment three of the report. Uh, there is a opt-out period in which the mem a member can opt out of the system at no cost. Uh, there's a deadline for executing that opt-out, which is November 24th. After much discussion with the mayor's office, LAPD and LAFD, our offices are currently, what we're, we're recommending that the city execute that opt-out at this point. Good. Um, the other, there's other three recommendations on the report. Uh, if, if you have any questions regarding any of those, uh, we're here to answer those questions really under the gun to get out of this. Right? Yes, yes. I was going to go through more, but, but I know we're, we're quickly approaching 10 o'clock. When yes. is this, is this needs to go to council, right? It, it would be, it's scheduled for tomorrow in council. Yes. Yep. Patty, do you have anything you want to add? No, just here to answer questions as well. Okay. Um, well, thank you for the recommendation to opt out. Uh, I'm a <clears throat> huge advocate for interoperability. You know, I used to work for Congresswoman Jane Harmon shortly after 9-11, and interoperable communications was one of her number one priorities. And I think what happened uh, the other day in Paris uh, is a reminder of how vulnerable we are to terrorist attack. Um, 
we're vulnerable to earthquakes, wildfires, and having an interoperable system is essential. Uh, but I have uh, thought that LA RICS is probably not the way to go. I think LA RICS has been uh, a, uh, an opaque, arrogant, uh, tone deaf uh, organization, and they have caused problems for their mission. So I'm eager to see us opt out, and uh, I'm interested but wary of the recommendations to sort of opt back in on, on, a, on a select basis. Um, but the chair has come back in the room, so uh, why don't you steer? No, 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 it's fine. No, I appreciate <coughs> okay. it. Thank you very much. Um, why don't you keep going and then I'll okay. point. Uh, so uh, I've got a few questions. Um, as I understand it, uh, we will opt out, but then uh, we'll opt out of one system and then sort of uh, come back in as an affiliate for one of the other systems. Is that correct? Well, currently we would opt out for both systems. Right. If we're an affiliate, we would be affiliate to LA Rick, so we could either. Uh, currently, under the LTA system, there were 21 towers built on uh, city property. Uh, so, it, it, in a way, we are affiliates even if we opt out, since uh, LA Rick's will continue to use those sites on the short run. Uh, there is in the future, if they do want to use additional city sites, uh, let's say for the LMR systems, those would be site access agreements that would come before council. For, so for are we opting back in for LTE or LMR? Uh, well, they, the LTE system, there is an option to be a subscriber to the system. So once the, the system gets to a certain point, if the city chooses, that they, they can subscribe to the, the data system. But, but all of that would need to come back to, to your body for approval. So we may use LTE at some point, or, or subscribe to LTE, but you're saying we're out of the picture for good for LMR? Uh, yes, we, we would, once we opt out, we're out. I mean, as an affiliate, we would still continue communication with, uh, with LA RICS. There, there may be portions of, of the LA RICS uh, project where they, they may want to use city resources or, or, or city infrastructure, and those would be agreements uh, that would be drafted, but those would need to come back to your body for approval. So, okay, they, they have to come back to us for approval. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, are there any costs associated with subscribing? At, at this point, the, the subscription costs haven't been determined by, by the board. That's subject to negotiation? And that's subject to negotiation. That comes back to us? Yes. Yes, we would have to, to get an appropriation to pay for that subscription. It's not something that exists, so council and mayor would have to approve that okay. in the future uh, once it's established. One, one of the things that I think LA Ricks has been um, uh, gigantically and famously bad at has been outreach and community engagement. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, curious what community engagement will look like on any projects as uh, with us as an affiliate you mean how will LA Ricks reach out to us as an organization if we maintain our affiliate status you know, if, if there are if, if there are projects that, that that they're going to be doing that are in the city what kind of outreach and engagement are they going to be doing well they would need to go through the the city approval process if they're if if they want to perform work on non-city owned sites. If for the LMR system, uh, they want to use city sites or they want to use city um, assets for any portion of the project, uh, they would need to come to the city and we would need to negotiate an agreement on that. So even for the LMR system, uh, they, there may be sites at a certain point where they, that are city owned that they may want to use. If that's the case, uh, there would, it would require a site access agreement that would need to be drafted between the city and Alley Ricks, which would need to come back to council for discussion, where it would detail the location of those sites and where, let's say, an antenna would be built and, and what the specifications were of that. And I, I would say maintaining an affiliate status helps us to keep those lines of communications as open as possible with the LA Ricks so that we can continue to, to push for the continued public engagement and outreach as they look to put in, you know, should council approve additional sites. I agree with you, their outreach um, and, and engagement with the public on some of the LTE sites was an area of frustration, I believe, for everybody. Um, and the affiliate status, we believe, also helps us to just 
continue to facilitate conversations with LA RICS as an organization to so ensure the, that the, we can push those conversations. So the, the, the joint report on the 13th <clears throat> says that LA RICS is working with the city's consultant AECOM to complete the environmental review, presumably for the LMR system, which is expected to be completed by mid-2016. <coughs> um, but then attachment five of the report to me, seems to contradict that by stating that under the opt-out, the city uses existing city sites with no new buildings and towers, and therefore no new environmental study or community outreach will be required. That would be for the city's standalone system. Sorry. Okay. Yes. All right. And <clears throat> the site access agreements. Um, we will have final say over whether or not uh, an LMR tower is placed somewhere in the city? Yes. The, those site access agreements haven't come before council for approval. So, for instance, San Vicente Peak, we get to give the, the yes or the no to that? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a recommendation on that as well. Okay, good. Um, the report, your report states on page six, um, over the next few years, additional LTE tower sites will need to be identified and constructed to achieve desired performance on the system. Uh, based on the LA RICS coverage analysis, how many additional LTE sites do you think are going to be required? Well, the original design um, had a potential of over 200 uh, antennas being placed. Uh, the final design, I believe, was, was approximately 180 antennas. Uh, the current starter system, I believe, has 77 sites, which cover approximately 95% of the county, but, but since the, some of the towers are so far apart, they, they may not provide optimal uh, performance at, at the beginning. Okay. Um, well, I'm eager to hear what the Chair's recommendations are. Um, yeah, so a couple things. One is we do have an obligation prior to November 24th that was stated to opt out of LA Rex. And I would say for a communications program, the one thing they lack most is communication. Um, but having said that, um, I think moving forward now is uh, we, we don't have really an option and, and we need to get this done to opt out. So my recommendations, I've got six of them, uh, would be one authorized uh, city representatives on the LA Rex Board of Directors to opt out of LA Rex by November 24th. That's the deadline pursuant to Article 5, Section 501 of the JPA. Item 2 would be to authorize our city representatives uh, to convert the city status from LA Rex member to an LA Rex affiliate. Um, number 3 would be to authorize the city representatives to collaborate with other public safety agencies in the region to develop the Regional Interoperability Communications Working Group uh, and then report back on what the functions of that group would be. Um, number four would be to instruct the LA Police Department, Fire Department and, and ITA to report back with a comprehensive plan to implement the city's standalone LMR system including required staffing, costs, project timelines, and available funding sources. Uh, my fifth recommendation would be that all future site access agreements for either LMR or LTE come back to Council for approval rather than just input or notification, but actual approval. And then number six would be to report back um, and research on any new or emerging technologies that are less intrusive, such as microcells or other technologies, uh, satellite-based systems that are uh, coming down in price, or anything that uh, may be less of a uh, risk or hazard. Uh, and so looking at all of those new emerging technologies, I'm going to report back on those as well. Is there a specific department you want our offices to report back on, the, okay. on number six? Or uh, number six would, would be working with ITA. Yes. Um, does the $18 million only, does that include staffing? Any staffing calls for the LMR? The estimate. Does, it, does that include staffing or is it just equipment? 
I believe that is mostly equipment we would have to double check with um, LAPD. That's a preliminary estimate, so we will come back in our report back with a more refined estimate, including whatever that's the staffing. Million, um, the $65 million, dollars, are those just for radio? That is just so for that radio. Include staffing either? That the radios does not include staffing, and for clarity, the radios were always going to be a city obligation, regardless of our status with LA RICS or not. The city would be on responsible for the purchase of its own radios um, and and part of the reason we are with such a large radio purchase is the fact that in historical from a historical perspective we actually delayed purchasing radios for LAPD for a very long time and so the last time we purchased radios we did so wholesale for the department and it was a significantly large purchase similar to this, and we now are at end of life on a department-wide radio purchase, so now we're at a department-wide radio purchase again. It is probably not the best way to purchase radios, but it was a function of our historical not replacing radios on a routine sort of cyclical basis, and we will work with LAPD on how to to address that on a go-forward basis. Can you get a sta the staffing cost by tomorrow? Staffing costs, we can ask LAPD how much of staffing was included in the 18 million. Yes, and there will, will be the 18 million isn't being approved through this action. Okay. There will it, there will be a there is the, the instruction number four for the report back by those departments with the cost. The 18 million does include uh, contracted services and equipment. Uh, there would be some some other cost to administrate the contract. Yeah, and so that was one of the things I want to make sure that uh, in number four. Um, that, that, that we don't lose sight of that, that we include the required staffing costs, project timelines, available funding sources, as uh, Ms. Martinez has indicated as well. Make sure that. Thank you, Mr. And, and I, I would note we do have staff that has been assigned to LA RICS that would likely just be repurposed towards um, this new system. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are funding some staff already as it is. Yes, and the report back would also include <laughs> available funding sources uh, to perform the work. Mm -hmm. that there may be. Uh, some opportunities to to use UASI funding for some of this work. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate the chair's recommendations, particularly uh, his uh, directive that um, the LMR site access agreements would have to be approved by the council, not just consultation, but approval. And there's because because for me, there's certain things I'd want to to see in there, and I just want to ask uh, if four things are, are things that we would have the ability to consider uh, uh, or, or reject, an L, uh, reject a site access agreement if it didn't have the following. Um, that we keep full control over our own property, including the sites currently proposed by LA Ricks. That we have <clears throat> the ability to dictate the design and aesthetics of the towers, as long as they conform to FCC guidelines. Um, that we be able to uh, determine the, the height of the yet to be constructed LMR towers and any new LTE towers. And that um, the city uh, in the agreements reserves the right to reject the placement of additional equipment from LA RICS or other government agencies or wireless companies. Are those things that we're able to have in the site access agreements? Uh, yes, the, the, the site access agreements that were executed for the um the, the LTE system did include language that th there could be space that was rented out in the towers, but but not without the city approving that use. Well, in fact, we had a motion come in that said right. no commercialization on any of the sites as well. That I think you and I co-authored. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And I must so say, I mean, stay. the outreach uh, may have not been as desired for for <laughs> for the towers that were built. Uh, but uh, when, when the city... When, when, you mean when there was outreach? When there was outreach, yes. Because there were times when there wasn't. Yes. Uh, but, but for the most part, I, I must say for, for other locations, uh, they were responsive when we did raise concerns. They were willing to meet with the city representatives and discuss those. So I just want... You're to incredibly together. generous. Yes. <laughs> more, more so than you would be accurate, I think. <clears throat> okay. So um, with that, we do have one card on this. And so um, they came in during the conversation. Kevin Modis. Now, Kevin, you also had filled out one for general public comment. Did you mean this one instead? Is that what you meant? You want to do both? I can do both, right? If you choose. Yeah. Absolutely. So come on. Um, this is just separate. Then. Yeah, you've got a minute on, it, on this one as well. So 
Yeah, so my name's Kevin Modest. I led uh, the group Stop LA Cell Towers that vehemently opposed this LA RICS program, and I thank you for opting out of LA RICS. The only thing I was to ask is, is it possible to opt out of any LTE transmissions through these towers, even through someone else's system? Because the concern of the community, and we got, as noted in the in uh, publications, 20,000 signatures opposing having cell towers near people's homes, these, this LA RICS program, 20,000 signatures, and the concern was exposures from the LTE system. So asking you to opt out of that completely and that no one use our towers to transmit LTE TRIS transmissions. Um, the Department of Interior has written a formal letter to the FCC stating that the radio frequency radiation from cell towers uh, is harming wildlife nearby and that the safety standards, the FCC guidelines for wireless transmissions are 30 years old and out of date and inadequate to protect people's health. And that was the Department of Interior's. Thank you very much. All right, so with that, um, seeing no other public comment cards on this specific item, we'll go ahead and move the item with those uh, recommendations. And I'll forward all the recommendations that we went through in writing so you don't have to just pick it up from the tape. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, then that is, uh, that is approved. All right, so now we, uh, I believe that concludes the agenda outside of general public comment. We have a number of general, general public comment cards. Rola Masri. I'm going to call three, uh, three up at a time. Sarjan Schwartz. Sarjan Schwartz. And Dr. Martin Blank. Blank. Yes. Come on up. Um, hi. My name is Rola Masri. Um, I am a chemist and a mother of three. And I have a child who is what scientists call a canary in a coal mine, getting sick. He has uh, severe food allergies. He walks into Starbucks and almost dies because of the smell of the milk. And I'm going to give my public comment time to Dr. Blank. We, we don't yield time, so the time is yours. We can't do that. Mind. Okay, so what I want to talk about is city government introducing new hazards and harms, and I want you to know that it's affecting our children. I'm a part of a huge mom group that's growing every day. Children with food allergies, autism, ADD, ADHD, um, you know, diabetes. So these harms, these radio frequencies that are being introduced into our, into our environment, there's a lot of science behind them. And they're showing there is harm. So please make decisions that will help our children to thrive. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I go now? Yes. Sure. Uh, I've been doing research at... Uh, if you could just state your name before. Martin Blank. I've been a professor at Columbia University in the medical school and doing research on electromagnetic radiation. And as we know, there's a big controversy regarding this. And you've got on one side, you've got the people who are selling all this new equipment. You've got the uh, uh, physicists who are making the, the determinations of safety largely. Relatively few, almost no biologists are involved in this. And this is my point, that if you want to judge the safety of something, you need some, con some biological input. And when you get the biological input, you find that the cells in the body, virtually all the cells, respond to this radiation with protective instincts. They start making stress proteins or heat shock proteins, as they used to be called. And this is indicated by, in lots of papers. And the thing is that we have actually analyzed the interactions with the DNA and found the groups that they interact with. But this is ubiquitous. It is happening all the time. There is a, a, an interaction with the radiation, and it occurs at levels that are lower than the temperature right. change. In other words, they'll respond thank, to thank you. heating. Thank you. Sir, I, but, I've got to keep everybody's time even, unfortunately. So that's, those are the rules we've got to, we've got to follow. But um, and if you do ever wish to submit anything in writing as well for the official record, you could do that as well. Well, I did submit a... Uh, yeah, we got the package. Well, if, yeah, perhaps you might want me I, I to draw I can't have a dialogue. To, I can't have a, the, the dialogue. The I'm not making don't, a don't comment. I'm just pointing out that there are slides in there that Appreciate show it. things that Thank would be of interest. Ma'am, good morning. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask if I could have two. Please don't start my time yet. I was going to ask if I could have two minutes. It's, it's a minute each. It's, we have to 
treat everybody again equally across the board. Hi, my name is Sarah Jane Schwartz. I'm here to discuss the top of Mount Lee, where there are two terrorist targets, the Hollywood sign and the emergency equipment. And this is surrounded by a residential area with substandard streets and dead-end streets. For decades, the top of Mount Lee was off limits, and any unauthorized persons were prohibited by regulations and motions from obtaining access to this property. This was all thrown out the window when Councilman LeBange, without any process, invited 40 million people up to this area. Uh, there were car counts done by Rec and Parks trying to divert some of the traffic. They had 160,000 cars in three weeks with an average of three persons each in them. Um, this is unprecedented. This area was always closed to the public. Um, the security consists of one person with cameras. It's frequently violated. I can show you dozens of photos and videos of people up there. I see people going up there with drones, heavy equipment cases, large backpacks. No one is checking them. We Thank want you. this shut down the way it's always Thank been for decades. This Thank is you. really Thank serious. You. Thank you. Daniel, the next speakers are going to be Daniel Rubin. Uh, John Maladano. Maldonado? Yes, sir. Apologize. And Jeffrey Wery. Okay. All right. Good morning. I'm uh, speaking on uh, behalf of the, the cell, cell phone towers. Um, I'm opposed to the Wi-Fi currently because there hasn't been an, uh, the, the, the standards that were set were are, are archaic. They haven't, uh, they haven't, this, at the subthermal level, uh, they, they, they set the standards of the F, 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 C, the F, uh, that uh, it be when it submits heat, but there's a subthermal sub level that, all, that uh, studies have shown that affect this, the um, biological cells in the body. And uh, in Austria, they, they have a, a, in, even standards that are even low, are, are higher on uh, limiting this kind of, of exposure. So uh, there should be more uh, attention paid to this type of uh, a thing and not just a blank uh, check or uh, uh, something based on, on old data. Uh, um, that it, it needs to be researched and, and more thoroughly before moving forward with something like this. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm also here opposing the Can you, If you could just state your name again for the record. Oh, John Maldonado. Uh, I oppose city Wi-Fi, and I think you should too. Uh, all of us live in the city. This is my only home that I've known. Um, and Dr. Blank would agree, and this is the gentleman that, that is uh, you know, familiar with this. It has you know, all the work done and, and studies done. Um, and if I can comment that the study no, it's sure, it's not a, you, you have already had your time, but thank you. But uh, I, Sir. You, uh, please. I, and in fact, you shouldn't actually be sitting at, at, at the table right now because you'd already spoken, but, but I appreciate you coming. There are no neurologically sensitive people who cannot be in the vicinity of uh, wireless radiation transmitters. They're called uh, EHS or electrohypersensitive individuals. Um, just look at microwave syndrome. These individuals will be made sick or uh, by your plan, denied access to city streets and public spaces. Also, uh, even our officers that are, are already have a difficult job is going to have their, or they're going to have their uh, safety and you know uh, health compromised, uh, and and your kids, your family, you know, if you live out here, you're going to be in the same situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Councilman. My name is Jeffrey Worry, and uh, January of 2009, I had a problem with a headgear uh, cell phone where radiation. I had to get. Uh, surgery done because of it. So I oppose a citywide Wi-Fi, and I wish you would please ask the Dr. Blank question so he can tell you how the FCC and the wireless industry are lying to us and jeopardize about this situation. So whatever time I have left, I'd like to give it to the doctor. Yeah, we, we don't yield time, but unfortunately we, can, we don't do that. Okay. But if I, if I can answer what so he we said. Don't, I've, 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 already, I've already told you we, we, don't, we don't yield the time, unfortunately. So, sir. Okay. Well, um, like yes. I said, um, the whole cell, um, cell tower thing is very dangerous for, I mean, just alone to, to people uh, on, on medical reasons. I mean, there's things mm -hmm. that that thing does. And I guess if you let him explain, he can do a lot more better than I can, sure. but I guess not. Thank I you. Um, and uh, we have two more cards, Shanita Shun Lopez and Kevin Modis again. Um, and I'll, I'll let you all know uh, as well if you're interested. Um, the citywide cell tower, which I know 
um, is being contemplated by the city and looking looking at that issue right now uh, for citywide Wi-Fi is what you're I believe you're referring to when you say citywide Wi-Fi um, is not actually even being taken in this committee at all. Um, it's not before this committee. It probably will never be before this committee. You could certainly come anytime. You're more than welcome to come sit through this committee and speak on any item, including general public comment. Uh, but that will be in the information technology committee is who's hearing that uh, subject matter, just so you know, just for reference. Okay, so um, our last two speakers. Shanita Lopez. Um. I'm presenting with Dr. Blake. Uh, in public comment, I have the right to present my information any way I want, right? Um, from you and only you, yes. <laughs> wow. Okay, well, I strongly oppose city Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi does not even work. You are microwaving your citizens for more service that will not likely work. The one that might work, you'll be charging poor people like myself to use it, um, letting wireless companies make even more money. So what is the vision that poor people will have to sit in the streets and use their laptops? I mean, that's not too smart, but that's very nice of you. Are the wireless companies like AT&T who donated money to your campaigns going to get citywide contracts? My money is on AT&T because their money is with you. Why don't you ask Dr. Blank questions and let him speak? Don't you care about the health of our people? Great. Thank you very much. Kevin? Um, um, I'd like to sh share my presentation with Dr. Blank. I'm allowed to present any handout or video I want as part of my public comment. No video, like but you can give a handout. There isn't a video like option. My oral oh, handout because he came all this way to share with this committee, and I'd like him to continue. Yeah, I, you don't, we don't have that option. I'm sorry. It's not. It's, it's part not, of my share. Part of the rules, though, are, are not to yield your time, and, and it's from you and only you. If you've got something in writing, it's either going to come from you or something that you can submit in writing to the committee. Those are the two. And the reason, it, perhaps to explain. So, sir, now you're, you're interrupting. So you I, have I a handout. Don't yeah. you want to know what's in it? So we have it. Yes, and it's been well, submitted. Well, perhaps if I gave. Sir, it now you're, inter you're, you're I, 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 I can't allow it, sir. Listen, the reason we're presenting. It's not to part of the rules. We have to treat everybody the, equally. The reason we're presenting to the public safety committee, and I'm sorry the other councilman left is because this poses a serious safety risk. We're talking about widespread exposure to microwave energy, microwaving your population, giving them cancer and neurological effects. You can, work about, you can worry about gunplay and gangs, but you're talking about innocent people and blanketing the entire city with Wi-Fi and now smart poles. Right, thank you very much. So and so, so with that, with that um, it, while that, do, that does conclude uh, public comment, I will all let, let you know as well that the, the two committees, uh, well, the one committee that's already going, will is hearing this and has been hearing this is information technology, ITGS. And then the other one is we do have a public health committee now as well. So um, just letting you know. I, uh, I saw health and. Uh, yeah, health and mental health. So mental it's public, health. yeah, it's health. Uh, but with that, um, thank you very much for coming. I, we have rules that are set forth in every committee and in council that we, we do follow otherwise. Um, gets us in all and, kinds of trouble. And, and because so, even uh, though we couldn't sir, do... Sir, it's not, it's not a dialogue. I'm just letting you know. Oh. Public comment is, is closed. Um, and that concludes the agenda. And so we are adjourned. Thank you. This was